everyone, and a very warm welcome to Beyond Markets, the global webcast for clients and prospects brought to you by Julius Baer. Now, wherever you're joining us from today, you're likely inside. As humans, we spend an incredible amount of time indoors. In fact, whether it be at home or at work or spending leisure time, between 80 and 90% of our time is spent indoors. But many of our buildings are aging rapidly. As a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, decarbonizing them is crucial in the fight against climate change. And not only that, investing in our cities of the future is an interesting part of portfolio building. Did you know, for example, the world's real estate stock is worth a staggering 300 trillion US dollars? Buildings are the world's biggest store of value and incredibly are worth more than equities and and bonds combined. Now, this means that so much of our money is already tried up in bricks and mortar. And so to protect it, it's crucial. So from the materials that are actually used in construction, using lower carbon, reusing of materials and reducing waste, to improving insulation, upgrading heating and cooling systems and finding clean sources of clean energy, well, the sky is the limit. So joining me to discuss the challenges ahead, I'm delighted to say in the studio live with me today, we have Karsten Menke, who is head of Next Generation Research. Hello to you, Karsten. Hello. We have Alex Nunez, who is head of Investment Advisory in Geneva and Monaco. Alex, good to have you here. And we also have Dr. Peter Richner, who is Deputy CEO of EMPA, the Swiss Federal Laboratories for Material Science and Technology. Now, Dr. Peter Richner's research focuses on energy efficient construction, circular construction, CO2 neutral technologies, and the promotion of technological transfer. Peter, it's great to have you with us. You're clearly <laughs> the right person to have with us for this discussion today. Um, so let's get straight into it. Maybe Carsten, I can start with you. We've titled this Future Cities, Reshaping Real Estate. What is a future city for you? Well, this may not sound very futuristic, but for me, a future city is one where uh, technology is uh, having a transformative role in making a city more sustainable on the one side, and then importantly, more livable on the other. And I think both of these elements, they come together in a future city in a sense that allows us to address structural challenges the cities are facing today. So are we already living in future cities then? Because we already are starting to see some of this smart technology come into play, some of the AI. Um, it's not necessarily something that's way out in the future when we're talking flying taxis <laughs> and, I don't know, huge big glass buildings. See, I think um, when we talk about long-term trends as reflected in our next generation philosophy, there are some, some which are more evolutionary and there are others which are more revolutionary. And I think cities by nature can only be evolutionary unless you start from scratch. Right? Because for us here in Europe, many of our cities are hundreds of years old. So we have an existing building stock, we have an existing base, which we need to improve over time. Right? So that's why I think we are living in the cities as we know them today, but the future can be quite different or has to be quite different, in fact. And, and Peter, uh, just bringing you in here on this, because one of your key points is, in fact, that it's not one size fits all. Our future cities will look different depending on where you are. Of course. I mean, it's very much related to our culture, where we are coming from. It also depends on the, the state of development of an area. So in Europe, in the developed countries, we start with a, a huge heritage. There are other areas in developing countries. It's not where it's probably not really a greenfield approach, but yeah, kind of. You really think about how can we uh, create those cities in the first place. And so there the questions are completely different. And then, you, of course, you have the question of climate. Mm -hmm. It really depends whether you're in the, in the subtropical area or in the central of Europe or in Scandinavia. Cities will look different. Paint me a picture then of what the cities might look like, say, in Asia versus here in Europe. Well, if I start with Europe, because that's what I know better, is, is definitely we, we have to get rid of using uh, fossil energy for heating and cooling. Just because from a, from a thermodynamic point of view, it's complete nonsense to use a flame which has 
is 1,400 degrees hot and you produce lukewarm water. That just doesn't make any sense at all. So this is more on the energetic side. And then on the, on the let's say, organization side of cities, a livable city is, is what people dream now about this 15-minute walking city, so that you do not have a complete separation of living, working, uh, retail or whatever, mm -hmm. but you start to integrate those things again. Mm -hmm. In Maybe in Asia, what we see is, of course, they have a complete different view on if we talk about densification. Like here in Switzerland, we talk now about a lot, how we should densify, but what we have in mind is completely ridiculous to if you go to Shanghai or something like that. And that we think something is dense and it's actually yeah, not. It's nothing at all. Okay. But again, this is related to culture. Mm -hmm. What are people expecting? And I suppose then this really informs the kind of developments that we will see. So how do we get to where we are now, although Costa and I, I appreciate we are kind of already living in future cities, to where we need to be? What um, are the main considerations, Peter, when we are building our future cities material-wise, recyclability, circularity, emissions, functions? What should we be considering? Point one is we have to reduce the amount of energy we need. So this is about energy efficient. Very boring topic. It sits around for decades, but it's the most effective one. Energy that you don't use, you don't have to produce, you don't have to transport, you don't have to store. So get rid of it. So this is about facades, windows, but even more important, it's about operation. Many of our buildings could be operated with only a fraction of the energy that we need today if it would be done in a proper way. And their digitalization gives us a lot of new opportunities. Like we, we have uh, two researchers of EMPA that they have created their own company now. They developed a system where they just have to put a, a little sensor into a room. They need access uh, to the heat controller, to the vent of, of the heating system. And within two weeks, they can actually control this room in a much more efficient way without changing anything at all. We, we tried it in our office building, which is from the 60s, mm -hmm. and we saved something like 25% of heating energy in winter. So this is a significant saving with yeah. just... You need AI, you need artificial intelligence, then, then uh, meteor data, etc. But it, that's not rocket science today, anymore. just do it. So this is point one. And then the other thing is, if you reduce the amount of energy you need, you can go to renewables, because you don't need that much. And then... Of course, you get to the point where all of a sudden the, the, the embodied energy and the embodied CO2 in the materials becomes more relevant because the operational energy will become less and less and less. And then there we get to the point that we have to build in a way that after a building has reached its, its uh, final state, mm -hmm. that we can reuse as much as possible. The materials? Materials, components, whatever. It's The ideal building would be something like a Lego building. You just take it apart <laughs> and put it together again in a new way. Okay, I think so you might be So this is about something. design for disassembly. This is the technical expression. Okay, I want to talk a little bit more then about recyclability and circularity in a moment. But Alex, I wanted to bring you in on investment. And before I do, getting to these stages, Peter, that you've just talked about uh, with regard to energy, this digitalization, you know, talk, looking at renewables, is the biggest challenge facing the industry investment into research? To some degree. The, the point, well, many of the things are already around for quite some time, but they have not been implemented. And the question is why? I think there is one reason until last uh, spring or spring a year ago, mm -hmm. energy was just incredibly cheap, nobody cared. And still the other thing is, as long as CO2 has not a fair price, many of the new sustainable technologies will not be able to make it on the market because it's not the fair game. Okay. What has is, what is also changed, I think, during the past few years, and that, that's where we need to bring COVID back in, the way the cities function, right? Because we have e-commerce, which has been accelerated by COVID, which impacts retail. We have work from home, which impacts offices big time, right? So what you said about a little sense or basically tracking how many people are in the office and accordingly steering the heating, the cooling, 
um, the air quality is becoming much more relevant now because we cannot assume that on a, on a single day for an office of 10, 10 people are there. So it, it's totally different if it's only five people there. And the system, when it's like smart, as we say, can react to that, right? Can, in, can, can decrease the heating or can decrease the cooling and then have this kind of energy saving impact. And I think this is where we again bring that future element in, right? Because 10 years ago, we didn't have the technology and there was also not the necessity to do it because we all went to the office every single day. But mm -hmm. now it's different and we need to reflect that in how these buildings are run. Okay, Alex. Y you mentioned uh, how fast it can go and where we stand today and what's the transition we're going to have here. I think it's an interesting question from an investment point of view because that's where you have also the catalysts in the markets. You have really two ways to accelerate or to accelerate that shift. It's one side you can go uh, with uh, real assets, uh, private equity that will take on the journey, that will transform the buildings, that will create value out of that. And that can be an accelerator. Uh, and on the other side, you have the listed uh, market uh, of equities where you have all these companies. I've heard about sensor, I've heard about uh, connectivity. Uh, here, as you said, you have many companies that are established today and then can pr produce value uh, in that transformation to build that city of the future. So I think the shifts, um, everything is not there yet um, and we still have a long way to go, but the shift is coming now uh, through those uh, types of investments. And tell me about our clients and the people that you speak to every day, Alex. Are people interested in investing in this because, you know, at the start, I gave this incredible statistic that, you know, so much of our money is tied up in bricks and mortar. You know, this is worth more than bonds and stocks combined. Surely investors care about the future of our cities and the futures of our buildings. They do care. They do care maybe in a way that uh, it's not a direct concern. Um, they come from, you know, when you talk to a client, um, he wants to have uh, protection for his, for his investments. He likes to go through the cycles and make sure that at the end he's not losing his wealth. Uh, at the same time, he wants to invest for his children. Mm. Uh, it's a, I mean, we, we call it uh, future cities. We call it, can call it the, the cities of our children, right? Because we are investing for our children. It's the exact same for the portfolio. You are looking at a time horizon, which is now not three months or five years, it's decades. So you invest for your kids. And that's the, the bright thing of having such thematic, such evolution in the market. So they are interested by that very much. And then there is a second reason why they're interested, because we have seen over the last five years, or let's say three years, um, a, a money illusion, as our CIO is saying, uh, Yves Bonzon, you know, we printed so much money over the last three years. That's a concern for a client. I'm having a stock or I'm having a bonds, a nominal paper that will be diluted. How can I prevent my wealth from this dilution? Mm -hmm. There you go into private assets. There you go into real assets. Real assets, they do perform super well. In context of inflation, uh, you cannot multiply it, brick and mortars. And you have a stock of buildings here of 300 trillion to work on. Mm. So it's a huge opportunity. And they, they are concerned about how to invest into these uh, type of if, uh, opportunities. All right, well, we'll get into a little bit more of the portfolio construction in just a moment. But Carsten, you mentioned a moment ago that this is a structural theme. Mm. What, what do you mean by that? Well, structural in our definition is something which goes beyond the business cycle, right? So the, the usual movement, the ups and downs of the economy as we know it. And when something is structural, you have basically two elements. The first one is the duration, which is longer. Mm -hmm. And the second one is also the, the, the dynamic, which, is, which should be higher than for the, for the average economy. And if we look at this building stock in Europe, there's the statistic from the European Commission that 75% of the buildings are not energy efficient. And what they're looking at is a run rate of renovations of 3% of the building stock per year. Apparently we are at 1%. So you start on a very, very low base in order to basically unleash this kind of structural growth. And this is something we are looking at, especially in the context of technologies which are becoming available on the insulation side, on the heating side, on the cooling side, 
which we didn't have before. And factoring in this economic element that there is so much value tied up in real estate and that people want to preserve that wealth, we think there is a need to invest right now to preserve this wealth. Because what we see is, for example, in Germany, a divergence of property prices between buildings that are energy efficient and less so. We see a divergence in terms of occupancy rates or vacancy rates in the UK between the highest standard offices and lower standard offices. And this is going to, I would say, intensify in the future. So if you don't tackle these challenges today, you run into bigger problems at some point in the future. Mm. So, Peter, let me bring you back in here, because where are we then uh, with the progress that we're making? I know that you brought along um, a little sample of concrete from the future. Maybe you can show our audience that now. Yeah, maybe. Why do we work on concrete? Concrete is... Or it, has the, it has the reputation as being the bad boy of the, yeah, yeah. It is. the construction Which industry. Is <laughs> completely unfair. Ah. <laughs> Complete, no, it's completely unfair because... You see, we are now about, I think, two or three years ago, we, as a, on global scale, we passed the moment where we have more man-made material than biomass on, the, okay. on this globe, on this planet. And more than 50% of this material is concrete. And now we know, okay, concrete is responsible maybe for 8% of the greenhouse gas emissions. 200 kilograms per cubic meter. But if you look closely, actually, it's as a material, it has a lower CO2 footprint than all the other construction materials. It's just the problem is that we use so much yeah. of it, 30 billion tons a year. And if we talk about transforming existing uh, cities, but even more so developing new cities, creating infrastructure for people on this planet which have no infrastructure mm. yet, we talk about concrete. Yep. It's the only way to go. So we need a way to have a concrete which does not have those greenhouse gas emissions. And our approach is that we say, OK, uh, we capture CO2 from the atmosphere, mm -hmm. either directly by direct air capture or via plants, biomass. And then we produce carbon. That's this, this black stuff that you see here. And we use this carbon to replace some of the sand and gravel that you have in concrete. You know, concrete is, is a composite material. You have the cement, this is the binder. Mm -hmm. You have sand and you have stones. Those three together, this mixture and water makes concrete. And now we, we pro replace some of the stones with carbon. And what does that do? Does that just literally reduce the weight? It becomes a lightweight, lightweight concrete, but it still has a mechanical properties which allows you to use this material, let's say, for residential applications. I would not build a highway bridge out of it at the moment. Maybe <laughs> we get there, but that's no problem at all. But the CO2 footprint of this material now is instead of 200 kilograms per cubic meter, is about zero. <laughs> and we see ways that we can actually go from zero to minus 100 kilograms CO2 per cubic meter of concrete. So this on a global scale would mean the more concrete we use, the better it will be for the climate. Okay, but it but, is a far reaching vision. But this isn't this minus one hundred. Yeah. This isn't just by this method. No, you we also work on the cement itself. Okay. So it changing kind of, the so chemistry it, of the cement. So it absorbs carbon. Yeah, it becomes yeah, yeah. an absorber yeah. of it comes a sink for okay, CO2. It comes a sink for CO2. I think this is super nice, and I think it shows how long this kind of future is we're talking about. But even today, I mean, the, the, the beauty and also the, the disadvantage of concrete is that it's so abundant and it's also so cheap. So if you're building a high-rise building anywhere on the planet, the value of the concrete that is used mm -hmm. is quite small of compared percent. to the whole value of that property. So in order to play it safe, what do you do? You apply a little more. Right. As simple as that. So are you saying then that we need to raise the price of concrete to make sure that we, that we, that we speed up the transition to no, this? No, 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 not necessarily. I mean, we could, we could do that, of course. 
But we could also look at, well, they call it improving or maximizing the structural efficiency of buildings. <laughs> yeah. So that sounds very technical, but at the end of the day, it means that you use the carbon intensive construction materials like cement, like steel, that you only use them where necessary. So, so everything which is carrying the most of the weight of the building and where you don't need it, you go for lower carbon alternatives. Or, or, or other engineering, I mean, this is really the point we have developed, or, or Philip Block from ETHZ has developed a new ceiling that we have implemented in, in NEST in our experimental building. And if you have a high rise building, about 60% of the mass is in the ceilings. So this is really where mm -hmm. all the material goes. And he developed a ceiling, which is kind of an arch, but the, the top will be flat where you use 70% less concrete and 90% less steel, but you have the same performance. And that's, that's where we have to yeah. build smarter. You mm. know, be more careful in what you are doing. And from an investment point of view, that's where it's <laughs> super interesting. Because when you come with efficiency, I, I don't think it's technical. I think it's really what, what's the future of our investments. When you invest today in a, in a building that will be more efficient, uh, probably cheaper, uh, it will also unlock value. And when we invest directly into uh, real assets, real estates, um, you are looking for such opportunities today and for the long run, because it's typical from, from private equity. W with our team of private equity, we are looking at those mm -hmm. types of investments uh, to lock money for a number of years. And that's exactly what we are looking for, buying a, a building, transforming it, and exiting at a better price. So with what you say, there is an opportunity to create value here. I think the time horizon is really something everybody should have in his mind. We talk about decades. Everybody says now 2050 we should be carbon neutral. In construction, 2050 is today. Because what we build today is going to be the existing building stock in 2050. Mm -hmm. So if we don't do it right now, we already lost the race. And we know we are responsible for 40% of the emissions, etc. all those things. And it takes decades. And, and this is where I'm really concerned that people do not realize that what they do today is going to have an impact in 2050, even in 2070. We will not be able to repair it then if we did not do the right things now. So is that a consequence because of this slow moving nature of the, of the real estate industry? No, it's, I mean, the durability of buildings is, at least the way we build them in Europe, yeah, yeah. we talk about 50, 70 yeah. years. So, and, and then you come to this renovation rate of 1% and you say, okay, I need 70 years to turn it over once. Even if you're down at, at if you would be able to go to 3%, which would mean you triple the sector. I don't know where you would like to take the people from, but that, that's another Fair issue. <laughs> Even if you yeah. triple it, you still talk about 20, 25 yeah. years. I think the inertia is also related to the, the fact that you have many different strategies. The one which is a defensive one is to buy an old strategy. You know, mm -hmm. with a typical building, you get rents, you get an income out of that and then you're happy with the income. So that's a very defensive strategy. You want to make more, you need to take a bit more risk. And maybe it's also where it comes to the, the, the speed of the transformation. You need to take more risk mm -hmm. to see more value in the transformation, to exit at a better price, and then uh, you have a better return as well. So maybe the speed is also linked to that. Okay. The Qu yeah. question is if this kind of low risk approach still applies in today's world if you own retail real estate in the world city centers or if you own office real estate, right? So you think you are in a low risk asset, but because of these structural changes, you are actually in a higher risk asset and you need to take action today, again, in order to preserve that value for 20, 30, 40 years in the future. And that's smart investing. Fully well, agree. Let's dig down into that then. How would you construct a portfolio around these because it seems to me there's so many things going on. There's materials, there's you know design and engineering, there's types of building. How are we going to use our buildings in the future? Nobody saw COVID coming. So you know nobody saw the fact that, that we would use our di buildings differently. How do you um, how do you construct a portfolio? 
Do you have one hour? <laughs> <laughs> in in five minutes. Look, <laughs> I would I would build the portfolio according to client uh, ambitions, right? Sure. So that's the first thing. Then then you use uh, future cities as a brilliant way, brilliant way to diversify, because this thematic is really about going into uh, uh, alternative investments. We we recommend like five percent alternative investments, and real estate is one of these uh, spots. So 5% of their entire portfolio should be towards things like alternatives, which includes real estate. Real estate. And there you have private equity program, uh, you can go there and then you can go along all these strategies we, we discussed now uh, for the last uh, couple of minutes. And, and Peter said it, um, you build a strategy in selecting the manager first, mm -hmm. the private equity manager, it needs to have a, a solid fundamental, solid balance sheet to do that. Uh, you look then at the locations. Uh, there is a primary location, secondary location, tertiary location. You can go into uh, Asia, you can go into emerging markets. It's more risky. So you diversify the location and then you, you diversify the, the strategies. One is buy and hold, like uh, rental income. Then you go for transformation and there you spot also uh, the potential for good transformation, more efficient, more sustainable, and you create more return. There you can say, the riskiest one, you can go between 15, 20% expected return. The riskiest one. That's the, the alternative part. Then you have the listed equity parts. And there, mainly, uh, you go for cash flow distribution with utilities. Okay. That's really where you have the bright spot. Today, you have a sector that has been down quite massively. It's a long duration uh, sector, as you mentioned before. So uh, you have an impact coming from interest rates. Uh, so the valuation is really low at, at, at the bottom over the last five to 10 years. So the entry point is, is interesting. You're talking about electrical equipment, concession, uh, water transportation. So you can invest there. Then you have two other sectors. One is industrial. That's one of the biggest sector in the world. Uh, super interesting because there you have all these innovation in terms of tech, AI, uh, sensor. You also have companies that are uh, looking at the security of the buildings. So here you have a huge transformation happening and the stocks uh, can create a lot of value here. Mm -hmm. And then you have technology, of course. Uh, semis, connectivity, uh, that's where you build all the 5G infrastructure. So many people are probably already invested in future cities through, thing, through things like that. But does it always have to be long term? We talked about this being a structural theme with yeah. Carsten, um, and you know we we need to take action now because our buildings are going to be here for many many years, and and this is about future cities, the cities for for our children. But does it have to be? Let me it, always. The the difference is when you invest in. Let me provide you with an example. Renewable energy. You mentioned it before. Today, the premium associated to renewable energy in the market is at zero. In terms of valuation, it's the same as the MSCI world. Just think about that. Three years ago, we had a premium of 30%. Mm -hmm. Today, it's at zero. Do you believe that transition will happen? Do you believe that we will need to look after CO2 emission? If yes, you have a zero premium today, you can invest and probably in the long run benefit from that. I mean, that's the problem, as always, in listed equities, that you have this kind of sentiment swings which are overlaying the fundamental development of some of these themes. And if things are in the media, if they are hyped, people tend to jump on it and just push the evaluations high, sometimes to levels which are not justified. Or on the downside, you have the opposite. People are just exiting, saying, we'll never have a future city, right? We'll, we'll just keep living in the status quo, and this whole theme is going nowhere. So we're exiting, and that's partly a situation which we have today, that people have exited clean energy. They have exited pure play heat pump companies, for example, because all, all of the noise we had on the political agenda in the, in the UK, in mm -hmm. Germany, for example. So this is something which you always also need to factor in when looking at thematic investing in listed equities. Maybe I can add here something. It's, there are two perspectives, of course. One is the perspective of a person who, who wants to invest his money. This is really a personal perspective. But then we have this global challenge that we have to resolve this climate issue. Mm. And that's where, where short-term versus long-term comes in. What we see is what happened the last decades is that we have seen a lot of development done by people that just 
acquired a plot, they built something, and they sold it. And the only question is, what, how much money could they get at the moment where they sell it? So they went for the cheapest solutions. They didn't really care about quality, which was going beyond five years. And then you're stuck with this, with those buildings for decades. From a personal investment point of view, it worked out very well. But it's completely contradictory to what we want to achieve as a society. And this is where I struggle with, you know, how can we really make sure that we can bring those two things in line? Because most of, it's not only that we have bad, bad buildings from the 50s, 60s and 70s. We built incredibly bad buildings the last 10, 15 yep. years. Mm -hmm. And they are going to sit here for the next 50 years. So how do we resolve that? Um, <laughs> I, I think that it is related to what's, who is investing with what strategy. Because then, if you have really a long-term strategy, you will be much more careful mm -hmm. about how this building is going to perform on the long run. If I just build and, and sell, I just want to make sure that it looks shiny enough that I can build, sell it for a very good price. But surely regulation, the political side must play a part in that yeah, because if that's there, is far then people behind. will invest. Regulation is far behind in, in what we need in, all, in order to, to reach those goals that we have set. Are you saying that then investors should take the lead? Yeah, have an opportunity. Nice. Yeah. To take I mean, the lead. Again, you see it, I think if you have buildings which are certified, let's take international standards like BREEAM and LEED, mm -hmm. they fetch higher prices, mm -hmm. right? So if mm -hmm. you have that kind of investment-led mindset on a long-term horizon, there is, there is really actually no choice but to go for this because you, you preserve your wealth in a much better way long-term. On the fund side, uh, listed fund side, you already see a, a premium for buildings that are efficient from an energy point of view. You see a premium today in the price. You know, these lab label like mm -hmm. A, 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 double B. Mm -hmm. that when you are on the upper side, you have a better value in the market. So just joining what you said, you're completely right. There is going to be a, a, a flow that is going to this creation of value in terms of price. And you, we, we see that happening today already, as mentioned by, by Carsten. So that's the natural way to evolve in an economic environment where you have, you know, capitalism uh, system where you're going to go for what, where you have value creation and not where you have value destruction. But yet if you, I mean, we are still stuck in a situation where we have a shortage of living space, right? And most likely it's going to get even worse because Building permits are going down because of higher financing costs, higher construction costs, etc. So the question is really how can we also, I guess, repurpose part of the existing building stock, retail offices, into apartments in order to help accommodate these kind of shortages? But and Peter, architecture is incredibly important, isn't it, for of developing? Course. You will not have, you will never get a, a sustainable building if it is not, not done in, in very good architecture. Because first of all, you're only going to take care about something if you like it. You have to fall in love with your buildings. Mm -hmm. This is point one. And point two is also architecture is not only aesthetics, it's also functionality. And there we are back to the point, we don't know what those buildings will have to, to deliver 20 or 30 years from now. So you, you must assure that you have a reasonable amount of flexibility built in so that you can use it. I've seen a, a very bad example right next to EMPA, uh, an office building which has been built in the 90s. It has been rented by a bank for 25 years. It was a wonderful building, granite for not sale. Spare, right? I was going to say, it's not true. <laughs> no, not true. <laughs> but it, the, the, the bank was only the tenant, so yeah. no problem. And then the bank moved out and, and the owner said, oh, okay, I cannot use it for another tenant. I'm going to tear it down after mm. 25 years. You destroyed so much value and, and all the energy and the CO2 which was in those materials is completely destroyed be just because there was this flexibility which was missing. 
Do you think, um, just something that people often say to me whenever they come to Switzerland, um, is that, you know, there's always construction going on. It's, you know, buildings are very new, very shiny. Everything seems to work very well. Do you think Switzerland is very quick to, to pull the trigger on a building and tear it down? I mean, or what yeah, countries that's... are good at, at reusing? Well, there are traditions. I mean, 200 years ago, we did it mm -hmm. because construction materials were extremely expensive back then to have a stone or, or whatever. So we recycled then? Yeah, we reused them. But now <laughs> we went through a phase where everything was so cheap, it was better to destroy it, throw it away and start from scratch. And, and we have to get away from that. And this again is this design for this assembly. Being able, like Lego, take it apart again. And if we would be able to do that, then we also have, by definition, more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Today, it's difficult to change a building. But if it, a building is designed for this assembly, and after 20 years I find out, ah, oh, now I, I cannot use it as that anymore, I just take it apart, not tear it down, not demolishing, but taking it apart and putting it together in a new way. And then I will have a will be adapted to a new use. Mm. But again, of course, this is a... If we would start that consequently now, it still takes decades mm -hmm. until we have a reasonable amount of those buildings. Are we on track, though, to... to oh. Do we think about circularity? We think about it, but it's still a niche. OK. And Karsten, yeah. how do you... I would agree. It's, it's few architects which have really embraced that kind of thinking of... I mean, it starts with, with components, right, which, are, which used to be like glued together in the past, which you can only like rip out and throw away. Mm -hmm. And if you think forward, it's really about like dismantling everything in a proper way, which most likely is more expensive in the first place, but gives you this kind of flexibility, which, which Peter talked about. We did two uh, units in the Nest building which, which, where we implemented that. So there is nothing glued. Nothing welded, only screws and mechanical connections. So two people with a screwdriver can take them completely <laughs> apart. It's not more expensive. It's not? Okay. No, it's uh. especially if you have also reused material because that's yeah. very... But there is a shift of the costs from, from construction and materials to planning. Yeah. You have to think more up front and also you have to adapt to what is available. And I guess the operating cost is also supposed to be lower. Yeah, there is no problem. I can't imagine the energy the... standard we reach the same, so that, yeah. that's the same. So w we are adjusting, right? The, the uh, energy abundance that we have lived through over the last decade is now over. So I think it also takes time to adjust to these new realities. That's the first thing. And then, and then the, the circularity of the economy um, is again a risk tolerance framework. Mm -hmm. um, we are talking about innovators versus transformators. And circularity is used in today's company as part of their uh, business processes. Uh, when you find a company that is only driven and operating on that, it's an innovator like you are today. But the risk tolerance is different because the risk for an innovator is usually higher. We were discussing with Carson about the universe we have in terms of stocks to invest. When you go to innovation, you go usually for smaller cap, higher return, of course, mm -hmm. at the end, but also higher risks. So maybe it's also explaining the speed of this transition again, you know, circularity, clean energy, uh, all these uh, thematic, we see that you have pure play into that, small caps, a bit more risky, very interesting, and then large cap that are more transformative, more value investing today where probably investors feel a bit more comfortable to, uh, to invest. Okay, um, just mindful of the time. Uh, we have had a great discussion. We've covered a lot of the challenges, a, a lot of the opportunities out there. Maybe I can just ask each of you, what are the next steps? How do you see us reaching our goal of future cities? Karsten. Well, I think it's, it's a very, again, long-term gradual process huh? because, I mean, Yes, we have this kind of 1% renovation rate, but we cannot like, lift it instantly, even mm -hmm. if we wanted to because of resource constraints. So I think when, whenever people think about doing something in their home, renovating it, right, changing the heating, improving the cooling, improving insulation, it's important to opt for state-of-the-art technology right? because this is going to stick with us for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, depending on what kind of, you, what kind of undertaking you have. 
And that's why you need to have this kind of forward-looking approach. And that's what makes me very confident looking at this theme as a long-term investment opportunity, because there is this huge stock of buildings that needs to be renovated. Okay. Peter, can I come to you? Are, are we changing fast enough? What are the next steps? Well, the, the real accelerator would be a real price for CO2. Mm. I mean, the most, most mm. of the things that we have discussed, why mm. do, don't they happen, is because we are cheating on ourselves or on, on our children and grandchildren. Mm. As long as we don't have a fair price for CO2, we will always struggle. Okay. And that's a, that's a whole other webcast. Yeah, <laughs> I know that much. Yes, <laughs> Alex, uh, uh, from I an was, investor perspective. I was thinking about this pricing of carbon. This is definitely the game changer. For the rest, it's, uh, it's about investing. It's about thinking long term, uh, seeing the opportunities today. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities today with a good valuation as well, uh, coming from the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Mm -hmm. So let's invest and, and think about the next decades, not the next three months. Well, thank you all so much for your time today. That was a really fascinating discussion. I really appreciate all of your inputs today. And if you would like more about future cities, and there is much more out there, our clients can reach out to their relationship managers for lots more information. Or if you're not a client, you can just search future cities on the Julius Baer website. Now, we're going to be back next month looking at the interest rate environment and the bond market. Very topical discussion, so do join us then. But remember, you can still get all the latest from Julius Baer through our podcasts. Moving Markets is our, or Beyond Markets, is giving you a deep dive into uh, various investment subjects on a weekly basis. Meanwhile, for all the latest twists and turns on the daily markets, you can check out Moving Markets, which is updated uh, daily. Uh, and you can get that, of course. In fact, you can get both of them wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for being there today, and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.